appreciate the, um, you know, Sean and uh, Kiki to come down and present their really exciting programs in coastal management and environmental <coughs> science. As you know, we have been trying to build partnerships with our public universities across the state. Um, <laughs> Anyhow, uh, and we're uh, to help us deal with the you know the burgeoning issues regarding you know and help us with the science and policy surrounding um, climate change and sea level rise and issues that we're we're facing. Another important component of this partnership and relationship with the universities, particularly those universities with diverse student populations, is recruit uh, future staff for our agency, um, but also to build future coastal advocates, environmental professionals, and politicians who care about our, our coastline, our environment. Um, I am a product of Cal State San Bernardino, and if it wasn't for public universities, affordable public university, I simply wouldn't be here. So this is incredibly important to me as a, uh, as a director of this agency. We have a number of students here today as well uh, in the audience and out in the hallway. They have some, some posters of their great uh, research and work that they're doing with regard to environmental science and um, coastal management. So if you could all take a uh, a glance at that. Uh, th they've done some great work, and so I'm going to turn it over to, to Dr. Anderson. Thanks, Jack. Thank you. Um, then thanks for the opportunity, you guys, to, to speak to you today. I'm going to. This is going to be a sort of mile high, really quick, just jumping through a bunch of slides here to give you guys a sense of the types of projects we do um, at Cal State Channel Islands. Um, so our program is the longest named program. <laughs> it's, it's called Environmental Science and Resource Management, and it doesn't fit on any application. Uh, uh, fields ever, so we usually just call ourselves the ESRM department, but um, we do do a tremendous amount. And just to follow up really quickly on, on Jack's comment, um, I came, I was at a big famous research university for many years, and it wasn't really floating my boat, personally speaking. I do mostly applied stuff, and I was leaving academia, and my wife actually found the job ad for this place about 15 years ago, and we both applied, and they foolishly hired us both. And this university really has reinvigorated my faith in public higher ed and the service that we do to our community and to the statewide. All, almost all the projects that we do here are begun with reaching out to the community and that provides the initial grain of, of sand for us to start these things. So everything I'm going to tell you today comes from different needs and different um, parts of our region. So the first shot right there is that's uh, the start of the Refugio oil spill. So that's 12 hours after the pipeline broke and we were the first team on site. And th those are all of our undergraduates doing um, this monitoring, um, in this case looking at the, the pre-tarring that was about to happen on this particular beach, that's El Capitan. Hit the next slide, pretty please. Cool. So to get reoriented, so this is a month, this is a couple months ago, this is during the start of the Thomas fire and our campus is in purple, right there on the mainland, so we're in Camarillo. But then we also have our, our offshore facility, our Santa Rosa Island Research Station, and we always seem to be in the, uh, in the thick of things whenever these events unfold. Um, we really are different. Having been at many institutions, many different places, our campus was uh, begun in 2002. We didn't take our first freshman until 2004, so we're very much the baby in the CSU system. We have various policies, various facilities and partnerships and really a unique combination of talent that allows us to do these things I'm going to tell you about in a second. That picture right behind you is the old, the old milking facility for the site and turns out that was a perfect place for us to fly drones when the FAA grounded the rest of the state. So that was technically inside so we could train students how to fly outside and still be legal. Um, we have a, an educational focus at our campus which is different than most of the universities I've been associated with and it actually allows for a lot of the things that I'm going to show you and, and provides a venue to attack a lot of these challenges that I'll show you in a second. Um, we mostly do applied coastal research and we have a strong, strong focus on interdisciplinarity. For us, interdisciplinarity means environmental justice, economics, chemistry, um, history, all that stuff. It doesn't mean biochemistry and physical chemistry. It means truly uh, interdisciplinary collaborations. 
Uh, most of our projects start off with an educational component or um, a particular uh, applied grant. In this case, this is about uh, we're in the fourth year of this collaboration with NOAA. This is a collaboration with NOAA, the National Park Service, and a whole bunch of other folks. This is our BWEP program, which is focused initially primarily on creating year-long curriculum for our fifth and sixth grade um, students in some of our Oxnard and some of the schools in the Oxnard School District. Using that as a, as a jumping off platform, it's been, in addition to just helping educate kids, it's allowed us to bring students out um, to the islands that have never camped before, have never been off cell, out of the cell phone range, all that kind of great stuff, and, and give them that experience. It's also allowed us to build up our robotic fleet. So through this program, we, we build robots with kids, and um, through that expertise, we now build robots for NGOs in East Africa. Um, we send robots to the South Pacific to help small island nations. All of this, again, starting with this effort of trying to educate our local kids and creating tools that are useful to a whole bunch of folks. Um, we do a lot of traditional stuff like this. This is uh, shorebird conservation work at Ormond Beach, all the stuff you'd think about, saving the birds, monitoring the birds, having public outreach days. Um, we also do more traditional things like marine debris. So we have long-term projects looking at the deposition of pollution on offshore beaches, on nearshore beaches, and we increasingly do a lot with microplastic. Again, this is all undergraduate research doing this. This is all of our um, students that are the drivers for this. So for example, we've sampled 51 beaches across the state of California. Every single beach has, is loaded with microplastics. Um, 40 populations and, and 40 beaches looking at the sand crab populations that reside on those beaches. Every single population has ingested microplastics. And so we're now following this up the food web to try to estimate what the health risk is for people and other folks um, across the state of California. Um, here's a quick example of what we've done with some stuff with the refugio spill. On the right is a tr what you'd see in a traditional lab. The right is an example of looking at the toxicity of this oil to some of our critters. In this case, these are little baby um, uh, crabs. And on the right image, it's too far away, but on the right image, those guys are, are healthy and, and we're exposed to clean water, no problem. The guys on the left were exposed to um, tar and have, are developmentally delayed. So there's significant impacts to that population. But again, rather than, than just doing the traditional biology or geomorphological stuff, which we do, we also try to couple this stuff to make it as useful to you folks and other, and other uh, users as well. So uh, on the left-hand side there, that's data from 33 beaches during the refugio oil spill. We went up, in addition to doing our, our environmental monitoring, we also do surveys. So we talked to um, many hundreds of folks, and we basically said, hey, how far did you drive? So on the x-axis there, that's how much tarring. Zero is a beach that didn't get any tar. Six got a lot of tar. And what you see on the top graph, the orange bars, the bars are all roughly the same. That's how far people drove to a beach that, you know, during that early part of the summer. There's no statistical difference. So people were coming to a beach uh, driving the same distance if it was a heavily tarred beach or a lightly tarred beach. But on the bottom, that, that question is how much money are they spending either the past week if they've been here or are they intending to spend the upcoming week? And that's strongly correlated with the, oil sp with the amount of oiling. So these kinds of data really help us interpret not just the ecological impact of things like spills, but also what it means for our community. Um, and then we do um, all kinds of other uh, interesting surveys. This is an annual survey we've been doing uh, since 2005, but it really has been quite rigorous since 2007. We survey between 1,000 and 1,500 people every fall, Santa Barbara, Los Angeles, Ventura counties. And we ask them a, a whole series of questions about coastal management. I just pulled out a couple that might be of interest to you. On the right is, do you recognize this agency? And you guys lost out to Coast Guard. Sorry, people recognize the Coast Guard more than you guys. But you're number two. And, and Coast Guard and Coastal Commission are the only agencies that show more than 50% recognition every single year. So you guys are, 61% of the people have heard of the Coastal Commission. So Merry Christmas. And then, and then our, our uh, <laughs> the, the, the beige ones there, those are two of our um, also quite active land acquisition and management agencies, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancies and, and their sister agency, the MRCA. They're obviously um, you know, half or, or a fourth of the recognition that you guys have. We ask about different, the public's impression of different management things and, and what their priority is. So on the left-hand side there, this is, they're asked to rank every year, and this is one through four. So one is the highest um, priority, highest threat, highest thing we should, we should deal with, four is the lowest. And what we've seen from year to year to year is everybody thinks pollution is horrible. So pollution ranks a very high priority for the general public. Pretty much everything else is all grouped together. 
So the public thinks that the biggest threat is toxins, is exposure to, to bad air or whatever. Um, if you ask the general public, do, are we doing a good job managing our coast? 43% say no. So the most common, and again, this is consistent from year to year to year, 43% uh, of people say no. But when you ask them specific management questions, and we have some posters on this out there if you guys are curious, when you ask specific management questions, they're much more positive. So if we ask them about the establishment of Channel Islands National Park, plastic bag bans, things like that, but when asked them the general level, they're like, eh, I don't think so. Um, what we find also consistently is 40% of our populations in these three counties go to the coast at least weekly, and 75% of our population go at least monthly. And we have data as to which beaches, which areas they're, they're recreating in, et cetera. Um, we have, this is a, a relatively new thing, we've been doing this for the last five years. This is an effort to provide better guidance for you guys and other folks, which is a, a rapid assessment of beach condition. So this integrates human stressors, pollution, ecological condition, et cetera, and we're creating an, indi an index of our beaches. We primarily monitor about 40 beaches, mostly in Southern California, but we're developing the metrics so that it can be applied to any beach uh, throughout the state. And you can use this just in general as an as a index, or we could use it if we're doing an individual project to see if this project of nourishment or whatever improves the condition of the um, site. Um, this is a project where we are working with various folks along the coast. The guy on the right there is uh, really into uh, uh, beach music, there's lifeguards, all kinds of folks, and we do interviews with these folks and we have all these resources up online free for anyone to get an understanding of how different communities perceive the coast. It's called Beaches on the Edge. Um, we're just updating, Dr. Kiki Patch is just about done with the newest updating of a statewide armoring database for the entire coast. So she generated the first one, and then you guys with the Coastal Commission generated a, a version um, uh, roughly around the same time, and we're updating this, and so when we're done, this will be available to you guys, um, and, and uh, all manner of riprap and everything is, has been categorized for the entirety of the California coast. Again, all done with students. Um, uh, I'll, I'll probably just go through these next two really quickly here, the next few, because I'm a professor and I'll talk for 17 hours. But um, uh, So this is an example. We use a lot of drones these days. So we build these units. We build these robots. Our students operate these, these guys, all kinds of stuff. Picture on the upper left is right after the Thomas fire. That's right behind the Ventura um, City Hall. We discovered a whole series of archaeological ruins that had not been known before. The fire exposed them. So we used our drones to map them in high precision to sub-centimeter accuracy so that um, whatever mud flows or whatever we have this summer, this, this spring, we can go back and the archaeologists can properly document this when the rains end. We use, uh, again, all, a lot of these tools we use in our teaching but are really valuable for you guys and in rapid response. The next picture is a citizen science uh, animal kill map. We've been accurately trying to model how many critters were killed in the Thomas fire as, as well as climate change emissions and a bunch of other stuff. Then the lower left, that was a, a, a rapid website we created with folks from across the country. We were the key movers there, but um, a rapid uh, citizen resource. So if citizens could get what was going on with the fire in real time. Again, tools that we use in our classroom that were really useful. If that video was playing, you'd see a real time 3D. That is Refugio Beach. And that black mass is all the dumping of the sediment from Montecito. So we have very accurate estimates of that and are monitoring that on the beach as well. Um, we do this up and down the coast. This is one of our students, or this is actually uh, Dr. Kiki Patch. We're looking at the dynamics of mouth opening and closings um, and doing a lot with coastal change. In this case, this is Ventura Harbor and looking at the efficacy of dredging. Uh, this is one of our students who's looking at coastal erosion down in San Diego. So we're getting very accurate measures of how quickly these, these bluffs are retreating. Again, this is all done with our, our flying units, our robotic units, all operated by students, all processed by students. Um, and Dr. Kiki Patch is uh, the queen of littoral cells here in this part of the world. And so she's, she did the original sediment budget for these areas. And um, she's now working at Broad Beach and trying to estimate the sand erosion there. Um, our newest colleague, Dr. Dan Reinemann, um, is looking specifically at a bunch of things. But in this case, sea level rise and the culture that is lost. Normally, we talk about sea level rise as the fiscal impact, which is an important thing to be sure infrastructure impact. In this case, he's actually interviewed surfers up and down the coast and looked at the cultural value of the coast. So who, who taught you how to surf? My dad. Who taught your dad how to surf? My grandpa. Okay, so this place has cultural value. And then using modern sea level rise um, estimation techniques, we're predicting what, which of those surfing resources will be harmed under sea level rise, which ones will be improved. 
And so we can talk about that as another metric to engage the conversation with some folks that maybe um, are perhaps more reluctant to talk about um, sea level rise and things like that. Also doing a lot with looking at underserved communities and how easy it is for them to get to the coast. So this is a statewide effort where we're looking at how how easy is it for folks to get to the coast? Are there lodgings? Are, is there affordable parking, et cetera? And looking at the demographics of these regions. And what you find is that the coast is no surprise on average is, is wider than we would uh, expect on a, a random chunk of a California property, less Hispanic, less black, et cetera. And so, um, so the next step with this is to actually look at this more specifically in some of these areas where we think we could make some policy recommendations and see how we can improve the access to our all important coastal sites. And then lastly, we are launching a, a professional science master's program because we've been asked for so many years. Um, and so this is going to be a program that, that continues a lot of these themes, but is primarily aimed at working professionals, so maybe staff members of yours or uh, uh, folks in the naval base, whatever, uh, working professionals, they'll both get, it's a two-year program, they'll both get um, content exposure, but also they'll be paired with a mentor. So if people are in a public agency, they'll be paired with a public agency mentor. If they're a park service person, a park service mentor. So folks can get early career advice as well as sort of the technical uh, new skills with drones and, and GIS and, all, and conflict resolution and all these things that we think are really, really key to solve problems. So I've, I've jabbered on a bunch here, but um, most, of these, most of this stuff is on one or more of our websites. You guys are welcome to check it out. Our main website as a, as a, for, for our program is www.esrm.zone. We don't use .com very much because we're too poor. We can't buy those domains. So, so uh, ESRM Zone uh, is, is sort of the catch-all for everybody. And then many of us have our own individual websites, blogs. We have an oil spill blog. We have a, a drone blog where, where we and our students actively post and share our research. So you guys are welcome to check it out. Please come check out me with our students outside and, and really looking forward to talking with you guys more and seeing how we can help you guys more. So thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you. Does that conclude your presentation? That's it. Great. That's thank, it. Thank you so much <laughs> for that for that um, update and all of that valuable information. You're I know I was fe feverishly writing notes. <laughs> and I think there was a website that we could uh, go to retrieve some of that information to, that will help inform our work tremendously. So thank you for that. Thank you.